Hey, hey, it's Shay Keister, and I'm your host and the founder of Casual Cattle Conversations, a global rancher education company that strives to bring honest thoughts and conversations from ranchers and leaders to other ranchers. Be sure to follow Cattle Convos on social media to have more in-depth conversations around the ranching business and lifestyle brought to you. If you are ready to take your operation to the next level and improve your lifestyle too, send me a message about my Rancher Mind group. Rancher Minds are monthly roundtable discussions for ranchers to learn from peers and experts and leave the call with actionable advice to make changes on their own operations. Alrighty, folks, thanks for joining me again today. Today, we have a special guest. Now, if you've been following for a while, you know that Hannah Borg has been on the show before. She was in episode three, and she had just returned to her family's operation straight out of college. So two years later, um, we decided that it would be time for her to come back and share how things have changed. And, you know, looking back now, what maybe she would have done differently and really just advice for anyone transitioning back onto that operation and facing those first two years of working with family again and entering a small community. Hannah shares very honest, vulnerable advice that is great for anyone to listen to. So with that, let's get on with the episode. All right. Well, thank you for joining me, Hannah. It's great to have you back on the show. For anyone who's been following along for a while knows that you were on episode three, I believe is what it was. So, you know, over two years later, it's uh, great to have you on here today. Thank you so much. It's fun to reflect over what's happened in the last two years. Yeah. So I know, um, so a lot of those loyal listeners who have been along for a while know your background, if they've listened to that episode three, but would you just give a brief overview of, you know, what your operation looks like today? Yeah, I'm the sixth generation on Borg Farms. We're up here in Northeast Nebraska around the Wakefield Allen area. And my family raises crops, cattle, and most recently chickens, although it's not as recent as what it has been. Uh, We've raised chickens for Lincoln Proven Poultry or Costco for uh, three years now, or two, two, and going on three. Uh, so we have a feedlot where we background cattle. Uh, we have cow calf operation. We just got done calving. And then my dad farms with his three brothers on the corn and soybean side, uh, have some hay and then pullets for Costco. So we tend to stay busy um, and we're pretty diversified, which keeps things fun for sure. Well, that's exciting. So I know it was I mean, right away when you had kind of moved back that we last um, spoke and really shared your story. So do you want to kind of talk about how, you know, what your role was right away when you moved back? Because you moved back right out of college. Yes, we got chickens Tuesday, my senior year finals week. Um, So I was home when we got chickens and then I had to go back to Lincoln uh, for a final on Wednesday, which I ended up getting really sick for. Cause I think after there's so much, um, lead up to placement day on Tuesday that after placement, I just like my body just crashed. So I got, I got really sick. So then I ended up taking my finals. I took two finals on Thursday and I've been home on the farm ever since. Um, so basically my main role that first year was to survive, uh, <laughs> turns out starting a business, with no prior knowledge, especially with livestock, is really, really hard. Uh, So we were in pure survival mode there for a long time, and we're out of it now, so it's fun to have clarity to how we think about things and things that we do. Um, But yeah, that first year was tough, and I, I knew it was tough in the you know, when I was living it, but I don't think I realized how tough it was because, you know, you always try to put on your um, your everything's okay face. And then you look back and you're like, everything was not okay. Uh, but now things for sure has settled down. So when you talk about that, were you primarily just on the chicken side? I mean, I know you kind of bounced around a little bit, but when you came back, I mean, was your kind of designated role to take care of the poultry side of your operation? Yeah. So at the beginning, um, my responsibilities were to survive with my mom. Um, So we get 60,000 chickens twice a year. They come in as baby chicks and we have them for five months. Um, So two rotations a year. And that first year, 
I guess labor wise, I was mostly in the chicken barns um, because chores took all day, whereas now they just take a couple hours. Um, but any chance I had to be in the feedlot or to be in the field, I took it. Um, but also I realized pretty quickly that some normal things that I should know how to do on the farm, I didn't know how to do. So I had to like relearn how to do a lot of things. Um, cause I, you know, I was always involved growing up, but not necessarily like I didn't drive a lot of equipment per se. Um, cause there was no need for me to do some of the stuff that now I needed to do. So, um, that first year was just a whole lot of learning, um, and just kind of figuring out the flow of things and figuring out, you know, what my responsibilities might be outside of the chicken barns. Um, but yeah, most, mostly chicken barns. And then I was happy that whenever I got an opportunity to do a job outside of the chicken barns. Well, awesome. So how has your role changed? I mean, it's been two years. So how have your responsibilities kind of changed as you've adjusted to being back home? What does that look like? Yeah, every day is waking up doing chores, just like um, I'm sure any other <laughs> livestock producer that's listening, the first the first job every day is to get the livestock fed. And I I do majority of chicken chores myself. I kind of had to tell my mom, you know, we were we were working together a lot and it was kind of like, mom, like you don't, we don't both need to be doing this. Um, Cause I feel like I'm kind of wasting my time, not wasting my time. Cause it's not like I had anything else to do, but I didn't feel like, you know, I, there's more, I could be doing more. And my mom, I felt like she was getting my way a little bit. I was like, mom, you don't, you don't need to be getting up every morning. Um, and so when uh, ironic thing is she's still up she's working doing housework stuff but I'm up in the chicken barns um so I'm doing majority of the chores myself um and then it's kind of fun we kind of have a good routine where I'm done in the chicken barns but a, a little earlier than my my dad and brother are done in the feedlot um I start a little bit earlier they wait till daybreak um, I go in and have breakfast and by the time I come out, um, we kind of regroup and if we have to treat cattle or if we have to work cattle, um, you know, we just kind of have a little powwow about what we're going to be doing. It might be shop work, um, whatever the seasonal task is doing. Um, and so, yeah, honestly, I spend a couple hours, not even a couple hours, like when the birds get older, it's like an hour in the morning and another half an hour in the afternoon. So we have to go through all the barns between noon and three o'clock. Um, just a quick walk through to make sure everything's okay. And then the lights go off at three o'clock because we only have eight hours of light. So now basically I'm, uh, you know, after I get done with chores, I'm at, you know, I'm there for my dad and brother for whatever they're doing, or if I have to go back and fix things. I will say though, when we do have baby birds, um, that first month, is for sure more time just like calving season right now mm -hmm. we're you know we're just kind of coming out of calving season a lot of other people are still in it it's a lot of work to have baby animals same way for chickens that doesn't change so you brought up a really interesting point that i think we could dive deeper into and maybe add a lot of value to other listeners who are um maybe they are the older generation maybe they are the new generation but you talked about how you had to have that conversation with your mom about how you could handle the responsibility of those chores like it you didn't need to of you you know a change could be made there so how have you gone about having those conversations because i'm sure there have been other similar conversations that you've probably had to have with your dad and brother as well and really your whole family trying to understand the different responsibilities so how do you ensure that you can effectively have those conversations and communicate that to your other family members as you're working? Yeah, it's wild working with your parents. Uh, it's the boats. It's the best thing. It's the most beautiful thing. It's also the hardest thing. It also sucks. <laughs> um, and I say that like in the most loving way, um, you know, working with them for two years, almost or three years, I, it's, it's come a long ways. Um, you know, I, I went in with a mindset that I'm not going to have an opinion for at least a year in terms of, you know, what they're doing, what decisions they're making, just day-to-day -day decisions. You know, I was very intentional about keeping my mouth shut for a year. Um, and I think I kept my mouth shut for even longer than that. 
Um, and it's not that they didn't value my opinion, but you know, I was coming, although it was my parents' operation and I grew up on it, the day-to-day operations I'd never been a part of. So I really had to take it all in, especially with, um, you know, figuring out the chicken barns. And then as time went on, I've um, kind of navigated language with my parents mm-hmm. of, you know, what are, what are words that I don't say, or, you know, what, what are things and topics that I approach with more caution? Um, you know, if I do have a strong opinion, how do I relay that in the most effective way? Um, you know, with my dad, hi dad, probably not listening, but in case you are, hi dad, uh, you know, asking him, well, why are you doing that is not the most effective communication, you know, help me understand um, your thought process through that. And it, it sounds silly to think about the language, but it's like uh, just something that that's worked for us. And, you know, I think they approach me different, or I know they approach talking to me better or differently than my brother. Um, so it's just kind of a balance of when do you want to have a strong opinion? When do you fight the battles that you know you are right on or you want to do things a certain way? And when do you just learn to humble yourself and just say, that's that's not what I'm willing to get upset over. Um, and it takes time, you know, there's no, there's not any of these big conversations. It's not like, okay, let's sit down and have a big conversation. You know, it's just like little, little sentences or little quick conversations that happen over time and then as time goes on you're like remember when we talked about this like I wanted to follow up um also knowing my parents as well as I do like I know good times (laughs) when to talk to them about deeper topics and when not to um and I think that's the same with any employer you know when to approach them and when not to um and you you know the difference of when working with your parents it's like, I'm coming to you as an employee, not as a daughter. And I need you to listen to me as an employee or not as my father or mother. And so figuring out those boundaries is really, really tough. Um, and those boundaries are crossed more often than they're not. Um, but as time goes on, I think it's gotten easier um, and we can have some harder conversations. Uh, and then other days, any of that strategic things strategic way about going about anything is just thrown out the window and you just try to figure out how to get the job done so uh there's no perfect way some days it works and some days it doesn't and you figure out how to mitigate or uh those days that don't work out well thank you for really sharing that I appreciate it so you know do you have like did you have like an initial support group or network because there are a lot of challenges with that I mean you had integrated a whole new species onto your operation, plus went through the huge change of college to being an adult and back on your family operation. So there was just a lot of change happening there. So did you have like a support group or a network to go to, to help talk about and find solutions for some of these um, challenges that you faced? Uh, Easy answer, no. And that's why I love talking about this or this topic. Um, So, you know, when you transition into college, it is that there is a transition, you know, you spend your senior year in high school, you know, preparing and thinking and picking out the perfect college. And, um, you know, as a girl, you spend that summer shopping for the best batting, all the dorm stuff. And, you know, you go to orientation and you, there's all this support for, um, you know, people transitioning into college, but turns out there's a transition outside out of college that there's no support around and that you know I'm talking that's even for you you know (laughs) you get down with senior year and you're like holy moly like what do I do now it's it's really a wild ride um you know personally to go from college where you're with your friends every day you're living in a community of college students um there's always things going on and then in my case I had to move home because uh, turns out living in a rural community is hard to find a, a house to live in at a decent price. So I'm living back with my parents. I'm running a, or, you know, trying to run a business with them. Um, I, all my closest friends I've been with for the last four years, they're all 
uh, hours away. I didn't really have any close friends. It's, it's lonely. It's so lonely. And then you go to town and people um, are, you know, they you kind of got to reintroduce, reintroduce yourself of who you are after four years of college, um, trying to, you know, make yourself known in a way that you want to be known. Um, and there's just a weird identity thing. And it's like, you know, my parents are very involved in the community and it's like, I want to be, but I want to be on my own terms and not always what they do. So, uh, I literally could talk forever and ever about, <laughs> you know, how wild that time is personally. Um, and then, you know, professionally when you're trying to navigate a new job as well. Um, so did I have a support group? No. And if I, what would I have done different? Um, I'm not sure. Cause I, I felt like I was doing the best I could at the time. But that's why I tell people like, give yourself grace that first year out of college. It is, it is absolutely a wild emotional ride. Um, you know, if you're moving back home, it's probably going to be lonely as you try to navigate those new friendships or re reconnecting with local friends. Um, it's, it's not, it's not easy. Uh, but eventually the cloud disintegrates and you look up and you're like, huh. I kind of like where I'm at. So just, uh, just give yourself grace, give yourself time and hopefully it works out. So that's, that's where I'm at now. I'm in, I'm in a good place now. Um, but it definitely took a long time to get here. I really appreciate how you said that, you know, you went back to the same community, but you had to reintroduce yourself for who you want to be known as within the community again. And I think that's something that, you know, I've heard other people talk about is like, you know, saying, yes, I came back, but you know, I'm not in high school anymore. Like mm -hmm. I am an adult now, like I'm in a different stage. So thank you for, you know, kind of talking about that and expanding on that a little more. Yeah. Well, for me, <clears throat> you know, I would go to town. So Wakefield, my hometown, uh, we have Michael Foods, which is a large, um, commercial egg laying, uh, farm. Uh, they have, they're huge, huge, uh, chicken layer. So there's, there's definitely uh, randomly in my community, a culture around uh, chicken production, but I go to town and people call me the chicken girl. And, or I'm like, I guess my friends know that I'm raising chickens. And like, I was known as a chicken girl and people still reference me as that. I'm like, no, I'm more than just the chickens. And so um, even having to embrace that new identity that, oh yeah, I do raise chickens. Um, and people do know me for that. Um, and I should be proud of that because we were an early adopter in that um, in that industry here in Nebraska. Um, but yeah, to just <clears throat> redefine yourself. And it's not like a whole re maybe not everyone goes through that. Um, maybe in a new community, you don't. I mean, in a new community, you're going through it in a different way. Um, but I I wouldn't trade my little community for anything. And um, you know, credit to a lot of people in town. They have, you know, seen that I'm serious about staying on the farm and, you know, they take me serious in what I do. Um, so that's been a big blessing. Well, awesome. And I'm excited for you for that. Now in there, you said, you know, no, I'm more than just the chicken girl. So how have you integrated, you know, being maybe multi-passionate or, you know, have you thought about starting other businesses aside from, what you're doing on the livestock side of things. So I guess, you know, kind of what else are you involved in to ensure that you're filling your bucket in all other areas of your life? Yes. Um, also love this topic because, you know, in college, I'm sure you're like me where you just are over-involved and you just burn yourself out. Um, and so I approach my community involvement very intentionally. And I said, I don't want to be the token young person, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't want to be the token young person person on every board. I really want to do things that I want to do, not just because my parents have done them or my family has done them. There are some things I do that my family does, but there's other things that I do because I want to do. For example, so I said, I'm going to be on three boards at a time and um, I will, and I've stuck strong to that. My main one that I'm involved in is the Dixon County Fair, um, where it's just a teeny tiny family friendly fair and I get to do all the communications work. Um, and so that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's how I get to use my, my communications degree 
um, my love for communications uh, in a full branding aspect for our Dixon County Fair. So that takes a lot of time and I love that. Um, I'm on a church board um, because it is important for my family to be involved in church and I made that decision too. It's important for me. And so I'm very involved in my church and then I'm also involved in um, the Wakefield Heritage Organization. So I love history. I love like randomly uh, Wakefield has two really cool museums. So if you're ever in Wakefield, Nebraska, please reach out and I would love to give you tours of our museums. Um, and so those are kind of the three main things that I'm involved in. And each of them I can, you know, I, I do some photography work and that's kind of a side hustle. Um, it's not even side hustle because I, I don't do it for money, a side passion. I love doing agricultural lifestyle photos for families. Um, I, you know, I shoot weddings if uh, friends need them. Uh, it's just kind of my way that I can use creativity and um, that's just how I can serve my friends and family. Um, eventually, I would like to maybe figure out how to help other families, you know, organize their family history um, you know, scan all those old photos because I think that's really important. I've done a lot of that for my family. I'd really love to help families, um, you know, tell their story through video and get some of those older generational stories on video or a podcast or just recording um, and kind of figure out how to do that. We're not there yet. But the cool thing about working on a farm is that there is a lot of freedom and flexibility until there's not, you know. <laughs> morning uh so right now we don't have chickens um so I you know I have slower mornings um my days aren't as busy just in the time that we are right now um it will pick up and become busier but even in winter like this winter I found myself with a little bit more time than I knew what to do with um one because it was an intense winter in terms of in terms of snow or winter or in terms of snow and weather um, and so I got to, you know, scan a lot of old family photos and I was like, hmm, how can I figure out how to get paid for this for other families? <laughs> uh, so that's, those are kind of the routes that, uh, lanes that I like to stay in. Um, so if you're listening and you, you, you know, maybe have an interest to figure out how to organize and categorize all your old family photos, or even want just like modern day ag lifestyle family photos of your um, family working on the farm. Um, you know, I recently went to branding and shot that and I was really cool. But honestly, like to me, when I think of my family, I see my dad and brother in the tractor every single day feeding cattle. You know, I'm, I'm walking chicken barns every day and feeding my horse. There's just some things that we do every single day. And I think of those, you know, images when I think of my dad and brother, and we don't have a lot of those images because, you know, we're working. So, uh, I think it'd be really cool just to document families doing chores, everyday things, things like that. So that was a long-winded answer. Yes, <laughs> I'm multi-passionate. Um, and I do have some freedom and flexibility and things in times, different times of the year that I get to do and pursue some of those things. Alrighty, folks, let's take a quick moment to hear from our friends at Performance Beef and how they can help you improve your operation and simplify your data. How do you manage data for your cattle business? Pen and paper or complicated programs? There's an easier way. Hear how Performance Beef has helped Greg Williams simplify his cattle operation. Before I switched to Performance Beef, it was an absolute circus. It was a cobbled up pen and paper, didn't know where I was setting, mess. I know on a day in, day out basis, what my break even is, how many cattle I've lost, what my feed cost is. On a daily basis, I know I can print that report page and I know exactly where I'm setting that day. Cattle producers like Greg are saving time and boosting accuracy with performance beef. Are you ready to start? For someone that's on the fence thinking about switching, just pull the trigger. It is a flat out game changer to know exactly where you're at. Reduce the guesswork. Search Performance Beef online to request a demo. 
Thank you to our friends at Performance Beef for help bringing this episode to you. And with that, let's continue visiting with Hannah about her journey and really implementing all of her passions and living out her life as she moved back to her own hometown to continue her family's legacy. Well, I think it's really inspiring how, you know, you still live out your passions while, you know, going home to the family operation. I think it's really neat how you're filling your bucket, making all parts of your soul feel alive in some form or fashion. So that's awesome. Yeah. It doesn't have to be one or another. Um, It is isolating working on the farm. I like to call it, there's a splendid isolation to the farm um, because, you know, a lot of things that we do, we're doing alone, you know, we could be working cattle, but I'm in the back tub pushing cattle through up to the chute, you know, or I'm in the, I can be in the field with, you know, my family during, we're going to, you know, in a couple months, it's weird to say it like that, but in a couple months we'll be chopping hay. So there'll be, you know, five of us in the field and, but you're sitting in a truck all day by yourself. So, um, you do a lot of things by yourself. Um, and it is isolating. And so recognizing that and knowing that and knowing what, you know, I like the term filling your bucket, what fills my bucket and um, having a handle on that has been really important to me because I see not everyone gets to do that or has opportunity. So uh, another thing that I've tried to be intentional about because I could get lost in the isolation and just, um, you know, kind of forget what I Mm -hmm. love outside of the farm. But the cool thing is I get to combine what I love outside of the farm on the farm. Uh, You want cattle pictures? I've got more cattle pictures than I know what to do with. So (laughs) I I love taking my camera out during golden hour and just taking um, images all over the farm throughout all the seasons. Well, that's exciting. So kind of shifting gears a little bit, when you, you know, looking back now, you know, is there anything that you would have done differently that first year you came back to the operation? Hmm. You know, I've used the word, like, I try to do things intentionally over time, or I've used that word intentionally a couple of times. And I think I, you know, you never want to live in regret or anything. I don't think I would have done anything different because I, I was doing the best that I could at the time. Um, I, I wish that I maybe did, wasn't so hard on myself. Um, but at the time it's like, this is really hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I I don't think I could have done anything differently because I was really trying to do the best I could understand that what we are doing is hard. Understanding that living with your parents, working for your parents at the same time is hard. Um, and so I'm glad that I was intentional about being like, well, I'm not going to join any bo- boards or local community stuff for a year. I'm not really going to have an opinion. I'm just going to survive the first year. Um, and that's, you know, that was my word of the year going into that first year on the farm was survive. And so knowing that um, my second year on the farm, the word was thrive because I figured out how to survive and I really wanted to grow in my role and not just be on a day-to-day like okay what do we have to get done like bare minimum like what what you know second year thrive how how can we you know make the place look even better how can we kind of clean up from last year things like that um and then this year my word of the year is strive um so you know I've survived I've thrived but now I want to push myself I want to figure out what more can I do Um, and so that's, that's kind of where I'm at now, but in terms of doing things differently, I I don't think I could have other than just, you know, being a little easier on myself, but I, I didn't, I didn't know that I could do that at the time. Well, thank you for being really vulnerable and sharing that. I think, you know, the whole grant yourself some grace, um, is important for everyone to remember no matter what stage they're at in being on their family operation or business or really stage of life. It's always important to grant ourselves some grace and understand that. And what that looks like is because it's easy. Okay. Okay. I'm going to grant myself grace or I'm going to give myself grace, but you know, in you're in the thick of something hard, what does that look like? And it's like, 
you know, really stripping your life down to bare minimum of like, I'm not getting myself involved. I'm really going to just focus on the task at hand. Um, I really had to learn how to like calm my emotions. I used to be a pretty emotional th- person when something went wrong, but I learned over time, like, okay, if something goes wrong, this is, um, you know, I might not know how to fix it, but I can figure out what is wrong. So I could, you know, tell our service tech, you know, this is wrong instead of them having to figure it out. Like just really doing things in a methodical way and, you know, turning that methodical way of broken things in the chicken barn to like in my own life. Okay, I'm feeling lonely today. What can we do to problem solve it? And really like slowing down and thinking things through um, was something that really helped me give myself grace because it's like, okay, this is hard, you know? this is not fun, but I have all these other good things going. And so let's embrace the suck um, and just know that this season will pass. And sure enough, it did. Embrace the suck. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I, it, when I, when I say it, when that first year is hard, it's like what I do in an hour now used to take us like a half a day, some days. Cause you know, we have a hundred motors that run every time we feed chickens. And we went in with the assumption that um, brand new equipment would run. Um, now I know that I never want to have brand new equipment again, because it takes a lot to get things dialed in. And, you know, if some things come, you know, broken or whatever, not working, it just takes a long time to get everything working. Um, and so that, you know, that's what's making it hard is every single thing that we're doing is brand new. Whereas now, like if something, I can tell something's wrong by just the way that it sounds, you know, I can identify things, um, you know, by the way that they sound or maybe a different, you know, something's just out of whack. Um, and I couldn't do that. Like that, that's what I mean. It was a fight of every single thing. It was like, okay, you had to think through everything you don't know. And it's just a lot of calls with the service text. Um, so now I'm proud. Like I can, I, I know how to fix things too. that. That saves a lot of time and headache. Cause if you have something broken and you're waiting for the service tech to come the next day, that can cause other issues. And then you're putting out those fires and it's just an ongoing battle. Um, our battles now are just a lot short shorter um if something breaks now it used to cause a you know there's some things that happen now that would cause a big ordeal in terms of like okay we got to call someone to get it fixed got to do this and this well now something breaks or doesn't work i know how to solve it i can solve it and it's not it's a non-issue now um but that took a lot of time to get to that place (laughs) And I can, you know, I can take that attitude to the rest of the farm too. Like if something's not working on the rest of the farm, I can be like, okay, I know I'm working with some sort of background on how to figure this out. And even in my own life, like, okay, this isn't going right. This friendship's not going right. Like, how can we fix it? You know, things like that. Um, I'm a fix it person now. I love fixing (laughs) things um, because I used to not be able to do any of that. So it's just fun fun, uh, to see myself transform with the just simple things in the chicken barns um, and how it's helped me grow as a person, even as cliche as that sounds. That's exciting. So as we like wrap up today, is there any last bit of advice that you'd like to offer anyone returning home to their family operation? Or I guess you could reverse it in any advice for, you know, maybe the older generation that's having someone come back, but what advice would you like to offer? Oh, I love this. Um, Advice for going back home, do it. Do not, in my opinion, based off of what I know and have learned, it's not worth going to work for someone else first. Um, You know, I I could have gone work for someone else, but there would have been so much that I missed out in the beginning years of our chicken um, chicken business. Um, So if you're if you're debating on going home to the family farm, do it, Um, you know, figure out financially, like how to make it work, have those conversations with your parents, figure out, can you have a side hustle to support some of your hobbies, things like that. Um, If you're, and uh, to follow up kind of like what I said, like really give yourself grace, know that's going to be really hard, but know that's gonna be really worth it. Um, For the older generation, 
you have to approach things differently when your son or daughter comes home. Um, teach them things that you just know. <clears throat> There's so many things that I watch my dad do. I'm like, I wish I knew how to do that. And it's like, well, he's been farming for 40 years. Of course, he's going to know how to do some of these things. So invite your son and daughter um, to be learners, to teach them um, things that you don't even have to think about doing. Listen to them, be willing and open to listen to them because, um, you know, we, we last fall, we got Performance Beef, which is um, a platform that we use to feed our feedlot cattle every day to, you know, help keep track of everything, basically. <laughs> um, and I, after two years, finally brought that to my dad. It's like, dad, we need performance beef. Um, and it was really, really tough for him when we first got it. You know, I think that first day after trying, he's like, I'm never going to feed cattle again in my life. The next week, he's like, I'm never not going to feed cattle without performance beef. Um, so if, yeah, if you're the primary um, operators with a son and daughter coming back, uh, just be willing and to listen to them, but be a good teacher as well. Well, awesome. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your morning to visit with me and offer myself advice too. I appreciate it, but I know you will, your story will impact so many other audience members who are listening to the show. So thank you very much, Hannah. Yeah, I appreciate it. Feel free. I, my DMs are open on, in, on Instagram. I love having <laughs> conversations with people about these kind of topics. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out and follow me on the, um, all the social platforms. And that's a wrap on that one. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the episode. And if you have any further questions around the topic, take care and have a great day.